sound useful? Yeah. Raise your hand, whatever you want, if you think about it. No rush. Yeah. <laughs> in several places in downtown Olympia, in parking lots and so on, there are obviously Haitian <coughs> springs underneath there. Yeah. Who's responsible for those? Who owns the water? Who, who, who has to look out for them? I love that question. That's Haitian. I have a partial answer for you. <laughs> hey, just Oli? Or I think of a couple of parking lots, particularly in downtown. Area. And how good is the water in those areas? Well, I'm about sure what's coming up out of a parking lot. No, I don't mean that. Yeah, the PAA is actually we get, we get most of our own drinking water from the people in downtown New York. Yeah. Finally, the TARDIS translates the life form speaking, and the life form refers to Doctor Who as, what is your question? Ugly bag of mostly water. Well, welcome to St. Martin's University and the April Science Cafe. And speaker tonight is Kevin Hansen. He's a county hydrogeologist from Thurston County, Washington. He has 35 years of experience hydrogeology, environmental remediation, and water resource evaluations in hundreds of sites in the U.S., Taiwan, and Mexico. As a licensed hydrogeologist in Washington State, he holds B.S. and M.S. degrees, multiple professional certificates, and one U.S. patent. He was an early responder at numerous leaks, spills, fish kettles, fires, floods, and explosion and an earthquake. Mr. Hansen and his wife produced the 2010 documentary, Nicotine Bees, have a new documentary, The Commons, to be released this summer. The topic tonight is Water, Water Everywhere, But Is There Enough? The Paradox of Water in Thurston County. Let's welcome. Them. 
Okay, thanks for having me. Let's see if we can get the sound to pick up. Step back. Okay. Ooh, squelch. Okay. So, can everybody hear that in the back? Is this sound level about good? Yes. Raise your hand if you feel the sound needs to be higher. Higher, lower. Lower would be good. Okay. I have a very loud voice. I apologize if I deafen anyone. You're, you have your, your pickup and you're, you're recording? Okay. Okay, great. Okay, thank you for coming. Um, Kevin Hansen and I um, do a lot of things with water. I'm the county's hydrogeologist, but it's sort of a synthetic position, and I have to step into many different domains. I'm going to try to follow the water from uh, the beginning of the water year and follow it through to try to make some cohesive sense. Hey, Jace. Great to see you, man. Jace works for Thurston County. Uh, anybody else from the county that I didn't see come in? Um, a couple of my coworkers are actually at a going away party for a friend, and they come afterwards to heckle me drunk. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize if that happens. <laughs> hey, so um, uh, let's get started. I uh, wanted to frame the talk as if we were walking through the. Yes, sir. Yeah, let's see how to do that. Great. Okay. You know, I've chosen a dark background, so we'll uh, we'll do the best we can here. So, uh, this is. Um, the Black River Stream Gauge U.S. Route 12, which is just outside Thurston County in the southwest. Now, this is what kind of a really nice looking river looks like in Thurston County. Yeah, we're blessed with some beautiful streams. I've seen some terrible streams, particularly on the east coast. And if I have a marker, yeah, if you've ever seen a, a real flashy stream on the east coast, its discharge will look something like this. Boom, 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 boom. Every one of these is a flood. There's almost no base flow. The base flow is this bottom piece down here. The Black River, on the other hand, beautiful river, beautiful river. Its curve looks like boom, boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom. And then the stuff down here is all base flow. That's the groundwater seeping in all year. Which brings me to my first question, why does a creek have water in it when it's not raining? Groundwater, yes, that's the right answer. All right, so uh, in our area, a nice river will have 70 to 90 percent of its base flow as groundwater. Okay, 70 to 90 percent of its base flow is groundwater. In a perfectly pristine environment, more than 90 percent of the flow will be groundwater, base flow. So the Black River is great because it shows us a little bit about the curves, it shows these big humps that come. Remember, this is not a single storm flowing in the creek. This is the month of December. You know what I mean? I mean, this is a month. This is a big honking wad of water. So we have some things that come down. Sorry, it's probably November, actually. And we come down here, and then we have this little base flow uh, component here. Now notice, logarithmic scale. Look carefully at my graphs because I use log scale a lot because the differences between the peaks and the valleys are so enormous you can't easily show them on a graph. So look for log scale. It's easy for scientists to use, and it can be misleading for the public unless you're used to looking at log scale a lot. So keep your eye on that. So let's talk about two different slides. You see this big groundwater bank down here, and we see arrows in and out of the groundwater bank. So the big arrow here, that happens in the wintertime schema that you're looking at in this conceptual block model has rainfall in, recharge, plant uptake in the winter, relatively small, a little bit of reclaimed water, the new human part, okay? Group A and B, big honking public wells here, outbound. Lots of septics back in, lots of little wells back out, stormwater that comes in and recharges, and then four big arrows. Base flow, you never, I'm sorry, uh, groundwater seepage out. You never see it. The groundwater seepage out is hidden. It's below ground. Base flow out in creeks that you would see, it's the flow that's always there. Stormwater flow, the big rush of water that goes out during a particular storm event, and then wastewater out. So look what happens. 
the whole thing shifts when we go to the summertime part of the curve. <coughs> Same groundwater bank. So all winter long, we bank it, and then it stops raining in our climate. We depend on that flow from the winter all summer long. Look at plant uptake. Plant uptake roars upward. Most of the little bit of rain we get is taken up by plants immediately. We re reclaim water is still there. Remember, wastewater is always churning. We never stop. We never stop producing wastewater. Uh, irrigation goes up like crazy. Group A and B public wells, pretty much the same. All of the small domestic wells and septics keep on churning the whole time. And we have very little base flow, a little bit of storm flow, almost none of that. The wastewater out continues to be the same. The Deschutes River in the summertime has a large component of flow fed by wastewater. It's once through a septic system and then it's into the Deschutes River. Now, don't be too shocked by that because natural systems are very good at handling what we would call wastewater. You know the old joke about the Missouri River, by the time it gets to the Mississippi it's been through two people and seven cows. <laughs> so, Kevin, yes. is there any groundwater coming in from somewhere else? You've got groundwater out? Um, I'm going to say no, but only because I define it to be that way. I picked the edge of a groundwater basin to do my work. Okay. So, uh, that's a good question. Yes, ma'am. How well filtered is that uh, wastewater that comes from the um, sewage and stuff? Because I was just, the study that they had on the salmon recently where there's a lot of drugs Human, human medications and stuff that are fi finding the same. Okay, um, we're going to come to that later in the show. It's a great question. There are scads of compounds present in wastewater other than fecal matter and nitrogen and nutrients. Lots and lots. Mostly at extremely low concentration. But there are numerous substances by list. So we'll, we'll come to that. Good question. Let's follow up. Now, October, the rainy season starts. For me, it starts with a little weather stations. This little guy is about three feet tall. It has a little uh, anemometer at the top for direction and speed of wind. It records rainfall. Our best, newest ones use a radar beam to detect snow and rain by the drop. And they sum the volumetric sizes of the little objects. I'm like, how is that possible? <laughs> like somebody has too much computing power and time, yeah. you know. But it's nice. It gives me a nice weather station. We also have stream gauges. This actually is a stream gauge concealing a pipe, and inside the pipe is a transducer, a little piezoelectric thing that balances a Wheatstone bridge, and I'll get back to that. This is what it looks like. Now, the reason the numbers look like this is because when the creek is high, you have to be 100 feet away with a pair of binoculars to, reach this, to read this thing. It's just too dangerous to get close to. And you see how the bands are scored? And big logs come through and tear out our gauges. I mean, this is like... This is like the, the mud wrestling of, of, of hydrology right here. <laughs> All right, so this actually is an older style uh, station. We used to use these. We've upgraded to a nice little self-contained hobo unit now. This is Howard Hama, who collects a, a large fraction of our data. Fantastic tech hydrologist. Uh, a lot of these are solar powered now or battery powered. So we end up with Buku data, but, but, here, let me go back. If I've got all this transducer data, how do I make it mean something? All this is recording is the level in a stilling well. What does that mean? Why does it matter? Let's see. You need something called a rating curve. Now, a rating curve relates the discharge in the stream to the level in the stream. And that can only be done by checking the discharge. And here, Nat Kale from our office, an amazing ace hydrologist, uh, numerical modeler, great, great guy, came up with this curve. <coughs> Every single one of these data points is a person standing in the creek, spending an hour stepping at 20 centimeter increments and waiting to stabilize their instrument. Now, this is an acoustic instrument he's using. It's a very nice acoustic instrument. But in order to be able to say something about how much water we have, this is where it really meets the road. You've got to get the discharges right on the creeks because that's where groundwater and surface water conjoin to become something we can physically see easily. 
So, if you collect lots and lots and lots of those things, you can get a crazy curve like that. Now look at that pile of spaghetti. This is, in fact, uh, the Tum Water Gauge run by the U.S. Geological Survey. And this is a stack of years. I think this is water years 2008 through 2015. Not all of them are complete. You notice a couple little hooks where they just stop. We don't know why. And there's also a big, bold red line. Now, keep an eye on that line. You're going to see this graph over and over again. Notice that some of these little curves that represent stream discharge dip below that line, and some are above that line. This is a statutorily defined flow rate for this location in Washington State Code called the minimum in-stream flow. So sometimes the creek's above, sometimes it's below that line. Watch that line. Okay, February, my phone starts ringing. This is why. Um, this is what is defined in Thurston County Code as high groundwater, although I get on my planners that it's neither high nor groundwater. It's both low, ponded, and it's surface water. But nonetheless, um, the surface flooding is a correlate to the groundwater system simply filling up. It gets higher and higher and higher until it's getting into people's houses and driving them crazy. And this is present throughout Thurston County. This is why we think of Thurston County as a wet county, even though, if you look at the numbers, we don't get much more rainfall than, say, Philadelphia. Wait a minute. Philadelphia? Isn't that crazy? He must be crazy. He must be crazy. No. It's just that our rainfall is compressed into a much shorter span of time. So we get a lot of rainfall followed by not much rainfall. We're a little above Philadelphia, actually, but not much, a couple inches. All right, so by February, my folks are crazy busy pulling logs out from bridges that would otherwise wipe out the bridge. And this is one of our trucks. We're out all the time trying to handle.